Hey guys, welcome to the Daily Word Bible Study of Plain and Simple, book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse study through the entire Bible. We are in Isaiah chapter 29, and uh, we're going to continue through. Again, uh, there, this Isaiah is rich with prophecies, and we, we're, 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 we're going to, and this is why when you read through the the New Testament, you, you read the New Testament writers, Matt, all of them, they, they, they cite Old Testament prophecies. Now, remember we said that there is what's called the near fulfillment, and then there is the far fulfillment. So Isaiah's near fulfillment has to do with God's rebuke of Israel's sins, and then their impending judgment uh, to come. Um, which will happen through Babylon, led by Nebuchadnezzar. But we also see that there are far fulfillments of the prophecy. We, we saw that in chapter 28, uh, about the stone in which not to stumble, the uh, line upon line, here or there, uh, uh, here, here a little, there a little way that God feeds um, his people the word of God. Uh, and of course, the stammering lips, okay? They're the far, they're the near and far um, application to that. So let's get into chapter 29. Now this is a, this kind of, this, this particular opening is very funny. When it says here, woe to Ariel. Now, I have to say that because my youngest daughter's name is Ariel. So, <laughs> and I tease every now and then and <clears throat> say, look, <laughs> the Bible is talking about you. Um, but it's not, of course. Um, so, first one says, woe to Ariel. Ariel, the city where David camped. So, we see here that the name Ariel is another name for Jerusalem, okay? So he says, woe to Ariel, Ariel, the city where David camped, continual, 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 continue year after year, let the festivals recur. I will oppress Ariel, and there will be mourning and crying, and she would be to me like an Ariel. Um, okay, so then he said, I will camp in a circle around you. I will besiege you with earth earth ramps, and I will set up my siege towards uh, siege towers against you. And you will be brought down. You will speak from the ground, and your words will come from the low from low in the dust. Your voice will be like that of <clears throat> a spirit from the ground. Your speech will whisper from the dust. Your many foals would be like fine dust and many of the ruthless, like blowing chaff. Then suddenly, and in an instant, you would be visited by the Lord of hosts with thunder, earthquake, a loud noise, storm, tempest, and a flame of consuming fire. Now, again, we see this Again, scathing rebuke. It's going to be even more horrible when we get to Jeremiah to see when these prophecies come true. Okay. Verse 7. All the many nations going out to battle against Ariel, all the attackers, the siege work against her, and those who oppress her, will be like a dream, a vision in the night. It will be like a it will be like a hungry one who dreams he is eating, then wakes and is still hungry. <clears throat> like a thirsty one who dreams he is drinking and wakes and is still thirsty, longing for water. So it would be for all the many nations who go to battle against Mount Zion. Stop and be astonished. <coughs> Excuse me. Stop and be astonished, blind yourselves, and be blind. 
They are drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with beer. Now, stop. I want to say something. Um, because I think it still goes on in a small way. But back in the 90s, there was this move called Drunken in the Spirit. It was, it, it, and, and again, it was, uh, you, saw, you saw a lot of charismatic churches that was claiming that there was a revival that was sweeping in the land. It actually started in Florida. They called it the Pensacola uh, Outpouring. And they used the term being drunk in the spirit <clears throat> and new wine. But it's, what's interesting is when you see the most use of wine is always in a bad sense. <clears throat> and that's the point I wanted to see here. I just to point out. Verse 11, I mean, verse 10. The Lord has put on, I mean, the Lord has poured out on you an overwhelming urge to sleep. He has shut your eyes, the prophets, and covered your heads, <clears throat> the seers. Um, it says, for your entire visions would be like the, uh, the words of a sealed document. If it is given, <clears throat> excuse me, if it is given to the one who can read and he is asked to read it, he will say, I can't read it because it is sealed. And if it is a document, uh, and, I'm sorry, and if the document is given to one who cannot read and he is asked to read it, he will say, I can't read. And the Lord said, because my people approach me with their mouths. To honor me with their lips, with lip service, yet their heart is far from me, and their and their worship consists of man-made rules learned by rot. I'm take a little drink here. Okay, <clears throat> all right. Now, <clears throat> verse thirteen. Again, the Lord said, because the people approached me with their mouths and honor me with their lips. Now, this is the epitome of religion. When you read, for example, and Jesus says this to the Pharisees when he rebuked them. The Pharisees is the epitome of a religious person. Notice he says, they approached me with their mouths. And they approach the enemy with lip service. He said, but their hearts are far from me. So there's a couple of things I want to talk about here. <clears throat> um, because I think it is important. As I said, when we come across these things, they are so important because we get the heart of God. And unfortunately, in the Christian church, what we have is a lot of man-made rules, okay? Man-made rules. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to read. I'm going to finish the chapter, and I'm going to come back to this verse here because I want to. There's some stuff I want to talk about. But let me finish this. He says, "Therefore, I will again confound these people with uh, wonder after wonder. The wisdom of their wise men will vanish, and the understanding of the percept the perceptors will be hidden." Now, this is, um, there's a lot of these, I'm, I'm, I'm flashing these scriptures here. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.19 um, is one where he quotes this and cites this. But again, you can see some of these verses of scriptures that are, are comparative here. Verse 15, woe to those that go to great lengths and hide their plans from, I mean, to hide their plans from the Lord. They do their works in darkness and say, who sees us? Who knows us? You have, turned, you have turned things around as if a potter were the same as the clay. How can, <clears throat> how can what is made say to his maker, why did you make me? Uh, how, can, how can what is formed say about the one who formed it? He doesn't understand what he is doing. Okay, I'm going to go back because I'm going to see there's a couple of things I definitely want to, <laughs> I want to, I want to talk about. Okay, so I, I'm, I thought I was, going to try, I was going to try to finish this chapter. I'm not going to finish this chapter in this, con, in, in, in this study. 
So let me go back to verse 13 because there's, there's a wealth of things here that needs to be said here. Um, the Lord said, because these people approach me with their mouths to honor me with their lip service, yet their heart is far from me. Uh, and, it is a, they, and their worship consists of man-made rules learned by rot. Okay, wrote, or rot, okay, wrote. Now, um, one of the problems here, this is the epitome of religion, as I said. Now, religion, notice, is a man-made religion, okay? Um, um, the word, by the way, the word rot or wrote, if I'm saying this correctly, rot, okay, um, is mechanical repetition. Now, you get, he get, if they had chose to put the word religion in here, from a symbol standpoint, it, it, it can fit, because that's what religion in. Religion and religious or being religious is just the observance of something. Now, I know a lot of Christians like to say that um, we, Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship. Well, this verse refutes what you're saying. You're very much, Christianity is very much a religion. The fact that you go to church every Sunday. And then when you go every Sunday, there are certain things you do every Sunday within this time frame, you know, of that service. And it's religious, okay? Now, in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with it, except when he says, they approach me with their mouth and honor me with lip service, but their hearts is far from me. So the fact that you go to church every Sunday, in and of itself, is not wrong. But see, religion, uh, the, the church or Christianity has been contaminated by religion. It, and, and it's so bad. We've been, it's been going on for really uh, almost 2,000 years, okay? It's hard. People can't even tell. So here's a good example. Today, most churches do not teach the Bible in its entirety. Obviously, they teach from it. They may cite a verse. Then some may have even a little more exposi what they call expositional teaching on certain topics. But in terms of teaching the Bible itself, it, most churches don't do that. Why? In favor of religion or religious practice. Now, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees because um, of this very, and he, and he cited this very uh, verse, right? You, you approach me with your mouth, you, you, you honor me with lip service, but your heart is far from me. So you, you go back to the Pharisees and you say, well, what, what is it that they were doing? Because they are very pious people. That's why they, 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 they are the epitome of religion. So don't, don't throw rocks at them because Christianity is not that far from being pharisaical. <clears throat> the fact that you see evangelicals in their worship of Trump proves this verse right here. That, that's, that's an example of that. The Pharisees practice certain things. They, could, they practice certain religious um, um, commandments from the law. Um, they pretended to be God lovers, but they wasn't. And when it came down to it, they showed their true hearts. So, for example, when you see in John 8, when they brought the woman to uh, Jesus and they threw her in the midst of Jesus and said, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. Now, the law says we should stone her. Well, who do you say? So you may stop and stop. Let's stop and think about that. So here they brought a woman according to the law of Moses. They caught her in the act of adultery. The law did say stone her. The law did say that. 
But now let's kind of peel back their deception. The law, they were, they were, they were correct on the law. But watch this. One, they wasn't obeying the law because where was the man? Worse, they cared nothing about that lady. In other words, they didn't care that she committed adultery or not. They were using her to get Jesus. They were hoping that Jesus would not obey the law so that they can then turn around and say, let's get Jesus because he's not obeying the law. In other words, where was the heart of God in the Pharisees? It, it wasn't there. Another example is they lied to get to arrest Jesus. Right? So watch this. They, they conspired. They crafted a lie and then covered it with Judas, one of his apostles, with 30 pieces of silver to portray Jesus, an innocent man whom they knew to be innocent. That's why they had to lie. So when Jesus was arrested, Judas has an attack of conscience. He goes to the Pharisees and he says, oh, <clears throat> we have betrayed an innocent man. So what was their response? Oh, Lord, forgive us. No. Their response was, that's your problem. Judas throws the 30 pieces of silver on the ground, and then he goes and hangs himself. And the Pharisee says, oh, well, pick up the money. But watch this. They, get, they got real religious. They said, well, we can't put the money in the treasury because that's the money of blood. How nice of them to obey the law, right? So they bought the potter's field. In their twisted mind, they actually thought God was giving them an attaboy because they obeyed the law. I mean, watch this. So the fact that you lied and betrayed innocent blood, let alone the son of God, forget that. They said, well, let's keep the law. See, that's religion. That's why he said they will do things to have that they will do a lot of lip service, but their heart is far from him. They don't have the heart of God. This is probably one of the biggest ways you can tell if you're entrenched in religion as a instead of a true relationship with God. Does your religious practice reflect the heart of God. So for example, if you go to that, you know, today's cutting edge service, you know, with a band and orchestra and worship, and you got children's church, and you have, you know, youth ministries, singles ministries, seniors ministries, right? And so it's a, it is, the services are catered to your emotions, right? But yet, you go to church and you're singing those worship songs and tears are running down your eyes. But then someone comes in and kind of bumps you. And then you get upset. Is that the heart of God? So you, you do all of that. You do all of that, but then what? Where is the heart of God in your religious worship? I would say this. Where was the heart of God in a lot of these religious service and they honored Trump or honored any, honored any political person, or how they pushed any political agenda. Where's the heart of God in that? See, I'm criticizing the evangelicals, but of course, Christian churches have been doing that on both sides, whether it's progressive or conservative, they've been doing that forever. And then at the same time, your religious practice, see, notice this, consists of man-made rules, right? Learned by, uh, 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 what do they call it? Um, uh, petition, not rep uh, repetition, repetition, <clears throat> okay? Man-made rules. So this is why you can always see that. In other words, people, think about this. Right now, you have several denominations that get hung up on uh, certain things. And again, 
you ask, where's the heart of God in their practice? For example, water baptism. There are people who think that God is so concerned about you got to get that H2O. You got to dunk him in H2O. That he doesn't care anything else about anything else except H2O. The, the, they're, again, religious people. Religious people. All right, guys. Look, don't forget to like and share this video. And um, <clears throat> if you have a thought, a comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. And we're definitely going to pick it up in Isaiah chapter 29. Again, these things are just pregnant with prophecy and revelations. All right, guys, I'll see you in the next study.